Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Ontario network of CAPC and CPMP projects, um, Maternal Mental Health Awareness Event. We're just really excited for all of those who are able to join us live uh, this morning. And, um, um, and those of you who are watching the, the recording, uh, we hope you enjoy the special event where we have uh, two wonderful speakers joining us and we'll introduce them a little more formally later, but we've got Ellen and, and Yvette who are going to share their knowledge and wisdom. And my name is Sydney. I'm the uh, program lead for the Ontario Network of CAPC and CPMP projects and I'm your host today. And um, uh, just a, a few little things before we get started. Uh, first, just taking a moment to to pause um, to uh, acknowledge and give thanks to the First Peoples of the territories where we, where we work and serve all across Ontario. Uh, where I'm logging in from in, near, in Kitchener, Waterloo, is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. Uh, but we acknowledge that this is um, a large area that we are all coming together from and there are all definitely other territories and, and peoples to be to be acknowledged. And what I will be sharing in the chat um, is a, an article that uh, came across my um, my my news feed this morning um, that I thought I would share um, in, in recognition uh, just about some initiatives taking place in hospitals in, in Thunder Bay around um, the ability for Indigenous people to, to self-identify in order to um, uh, receive health services. So um, I just thought it was an interesting step um, that, that, that's, that they are saying they're taking in, in uh, response to the calls to action. So I'll be sharing that in the chat <laughs> for, for everybody to, to access. So before we get into, uh, before we introduce Yvette, who'll be speaking first, I also want to welcome Blanca Serrano, who is our program consultant from Public Health Agency of Canada, and she's going to say a few words. Blanca. Thanks, Sydney, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Uh, it's really great to be able to be all together uh, to come you know, and learn about the work of our projects in the area of uh, maternal mental health. And actually that was, that's kind of the, um, the, the goal for having this event. Mm -hmm. um, the World Maternal Mental Health Awareness Day was May 5th, it was last week. Um, and World Maternal Mental Health Day, uh, I be believe it started in 2016. And um, it was to do that, to raise awareness about the important issue of maternal mental mental health. Um, many countries were part of this movement from the get-go and others joined along the way. Canada was not one of them. But as of May 5th, this May 5th, um, the House of Commons unanimous, unanimously carried a motion to have Canada recognize uh, the first Wednesday of May as a World Maternal Mental Health Day. So that is a small victory, you know, um, it's something that a group of people in Ontario started actually, and just, you know, kept at it. These were champions and um, they have, you know, had this, this great victory for Canada. Uh, I mean, re having a day be recognized may seem small, but I think it is something that gets us to uh, bring the issue forward uh, for people that may not even have thought about, you know, uh, men maternal mental health, perinatal mental health as an issue. Uh, we tend to think sometimes that healthcare, you know, takes care of that, and uh, moms are well taken care of. But uh, we know that that's not the case in Canada. Um, Twenty percent of uh, women and ten percent of men suffer from uh, perinatal mental health illness, and um, the rates, as we know, have increased during the pandemic, almost doubled, uh, if not tripled, in some areas. We know that there are specific groups that suffer this issue. Um, that are overrepresented in some of these, uh, you know, concerns. So I, you know, I think that is such an important issue to, to bring forward and to uh, raise awareness about. 
and also, you know, to raise awareness about the work that our programs do, CAPC and CPMP, because all of you do this work every day. And uh, I wanted to thank you on behalf of uh, CAPC CPMP at the Public Health Agency of Canada, because uh, your role is, you're probably the only person in many uh, moms or dads lives that has this wraparound support and you do that every day. So thank you and thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy the presentations from Yvette and Ellen. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Um, and what, one more thing before we get going is that we do have a little give, giveaway resource today. And um, Ellen has suggested a, a book. Do you have it handy, Ellen? Do you want to uh, hand it up? It's called Self Care for Mom. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I see that really good. So um, we are going to give away two copies of the book, one after each of the presentations. And uh, Blanca is going to, you know, as we listen to the presentation, she's going to come up with a, a question for a little contest. Um, so keep your ears open, and then uh, we will we will give a, give away a one copy after Yvette's uh, talk, and then another after Ellen. So without any further ado, um, I am pleased to introduce you to, for those who haven't already met her, Yvette Vakdaldru, who is going to um, speak to us today. And she is the uh, Executive Director of Girls Inc. in Durham. Did I get any, all that right? And, and I'm sure she will share a little bit more about herself. Um, so um, welcome, Yvette, and we, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, I am Yvette Nekvatel drew I'm the Executive Director of Girls Inc. We are the Administrator of the Canadian Prenatal Nutrition Project for here in Durham Region. Um, I have been uh, the executive director for, uh, it's going to be 17 years in August, hard to believe, uh, but been involved with CAPC and CPMP for uh, almost all the 25 years that it's been around. So it's amazing to sort of see, you know, the evolution of the pilot project to uh, multidisciplinary sites throughout our region and how we have sort of changed with the changing needs of women. Uh, like many of you, um, you know, when we came into contact uh, with um, our organizations and administrating. We had many community partners. Uh, we partner with our local shelters, our food banks, clothing banks, grocery stores, um, our pharmacies. And we also have uh, public health departments. We have midwives. We have community health centers and other community organizations in our community that help support our uh, multidisciplinary teams offsite. Uh, we have child protection uh, agencies as well. And our focus uh, for our region is young teen moms, 26 years of age or under, with the impact um, to get uh, them involved as early in their pregnancy as they can, to reduce the risk of their pregnancy complications and ensure that their babies and pregnancy uh, gets off to a great start. We looked at pre-COVID sort of numbers, we had 43% of our participants identified as being low income, having uh, feelings of isolation and being isolated, uh, not connected to any services in the community. And 37% of them had identified as food insecurities. So we offer eight sites across Durham region. Uh, three are in Oshawa, we have one in Ajax, Uxbridge, Beaverton, Cannington, and Bowmanville. And we do the North site in combination with our Community Action Program for Children uh, partner as well that helps uh, deliver this sort of seamless approach to our uh, prenatal as well as postpartum uh, after under six years of age. 
So the topics that we cover within our communities focus anything from infant care, our prenatal nutrition, infant safe sleep environment, food security. We actually have a formal component at our sites uh, and looking at um, parent child uh, attachment, breastfeeding support and education healthy relationships, healthy eating, as well as the postpartum. So our young moms who uh, enter our program stay within our program up until their babies are six months of age postpartum. And like many of you at the beginning, uh, we thought uh, when COVID hit, this would be a short lived experience, right? We would take our SARS pandemic plan that we had, we dust it off and put it in action and we're good. We got this sort of covered. Uh, when we heard from our participants, you know, as soon as um, the lockdown, the first lockdown came down, uh, that, that they were very anxious and very nervous that they heard and, and they were unsettled about what does this mean? Uh, now that they have to go to doctor's appointments and lab tests by themselves, um, potentially expose themselves to uh, COVID, which we knew very little about at the time. Uh, and so they were incredibly anxious. And I think that one of the things that we identified is that most pregnant women are anxious at uh, the best of times, but I think that this lens really uh, allowed us to kind of see what were some of the worries that our participants were telling to this. Um, many of them did not have a support system. That's why they came to Food for Thought to connect, to find people in their community that they could, you know, talk to and express certain anxieties and issues to. They were really worried about what if they got bad news? Like what, what did they do with that? How, who do they share that with? Will they be able to handle the information and how to navigate through all of the, the information without being able to go to places? Many places were shutting down. Many places um, had calls or information where people weren't answering their phones. Um, so they didn't really know who who was going to support them. So we know that working with vulnerable populations, we have a really strong, important role in empowering them to feel supported, preparing and educating them on the pandemic differences can help also calm them down, re relieve and alleviate some of that stress and anxiety and help them paint a new picture about what their pregnancy uh, experience will look like during a pandemic. When we look at sort of pregnancy and support, um, our team, we identify that many women that we serve had food insecurities, homeless, uh, and some of them had identified uh, with abuse uh, in their home, poverty, uh, homelessness initiative, as well as mental health in initiatives. And we had moms that were kind of saying that even if they had a partner or a support person in their lives, um, they were worried that, you know, they'd come back and come home with an ultrasound picture and that it was very difficult for their partner and people in their lives to connect uh, because they didn't feel like they were involved in any of that process. Um, and so I think that that was one of the things that when we heard um, information was really important, not only information for them, but also information that we can give that they can then share with their support systems. So as time went on, we saw that the information was changing rapidly with around COVID-19 and then all of a sudden hearing of all about uh, the different variants. And we knew that as CPMP projects, uh, we play a critical role in making sure that we answer COVID-19 questions, that we point them to resources that are information and, and uh, research-based information that they know where to go to get the most up-to-date, accurate information, that how it affects their pregnancy and their babies, uh, kind of weaving through the high anxiety, fear-based news, um, you know, Twitter click bites that, that was kind of circulating in the, in, in the beginning and probably still does. 
Uh, so most women can feel anxious at the best of times during their pregnancy and at the heightened uh, of the COVID-19 virus, we know that our role was pivotal. So we focused a lot on educating our clients, giving them the links and resources, um, and also to direct them uh, to where they can go for information, help and support. So uh, we had uh, some new immigrant moms who uh, came English as a second language, maybe had, did not have a health card, looking at how do we, they navigate um, support in, in, and uh, making sure that we help cut the red tape and get them connected to the service providers in our community um, to help alleviate some of those roadblocks. So we know that our demographic uses technology and <laughs> uses it really, really well. And I think that that was one of the things that when we looked at uh, how can we use text messaging and in order for us to be able to sort of pivot uh, meeting our needs clients uh, into me meeting their needs at home. Many of our clients uh, shared that they often felt um, ostracized or excluded uh, by their family or other community uh, agencies, uh, and they didn't feel welcome. So making sure that we're meeting their needs where they're at, as opposed to what we think they have. Uh, so our team worked really hard pre-COVID to offer a safe, non-judgmental, supportive system that allowed women to sort of engage and build a network of support that allowed them uh, to work and develop coping skills, parenting support, uh, assist in many of the needs that they had uh, that they needed to, to meet, uh, and work on coaching and mentoring uh, and giving opportunities to learn good problem solving skills. Um, and I think that our team helped support in these sort of select settings to have sort of that community. And now all of a sudden there's a lockdown and a shutdown and an, an ability for us to be able to support women where they're at. So we use this hot, um, population health approach to attempt to how do we preserve sort of this uh, environment in kind of looking at serving the, the whole woman, uh, as well as closing the gaps to reduce some of the inequalities that we heard that uh, they have in, in trying to get formal population uh, acceptance and connection of services in our community. So our project uh, impacts are many as many of you uh, as well. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that supports uh, our, um, our, our young women. We have midwives, nursing students, social workers, uh, access to community agencies like Rose of Durham and uh, CA Children's Aid Society, as well as an early childhood educator to support the work when they would come to the site. So now we found ourselves uh, during COVID and we're on, on a lockdown. And as many of you, um, you know, we looked at the methodologies to deliver. Um, we did change how we're going to provide services, just not, not what we're going to provide. So our multidisciplinary team took the information of what the needs are for, for our, our uh, target. And we kind of looked at what are some ways that we can look and transition. So working with our um, population, we wanted to make sure that we were connecting with them, educating them on the pandemic differences and how to calm some of that stress and anxiety and allow them to kind of use technology because many of uh, our young moms said that they have cell phones, uh, they utilize it all the time, but what they don't have is data. Uh, they can't afford uh, data and um, sometimes their internet and the phone services within their their uh, units where they live was very spotty their wi-fi may be uh, difficult so asking them to do zoom sometimes was a barrier we also heard from clients that um, they were very tentative to get on to a call like this because they felt that they may be judged, uh, worrying about, you know, not wanting to have their camera on, but not getting a lot out of it if it's just a, a black screen. 
So we gave them some suggestions that the young moms who didn't have a phone, we got them access to cell phones. Uh, we have uh, contracts and, and connections with local TELUS that has um, opportunities as well as some of our partner agencies to be able to get them that cell phone. Uh, we suggest that they bring a cell phone or to, if they have uh, take a video uh, of the screen while they're having their appointment and their ultrasounds. Um, we ask them if, if they can FaceTime with their partner as well as if they're having their ultrasound that allow that engagement or their support person in their life so that they can share that experience again at a later time, not feeling so alone and isolated. Also having somebody to be able to drive them uh, to an appointment and to come back, even having safe protocols, um, just so that they can share the joy, right? And that they had as soon as the, that they were done, even with the car, had a huge impact on their mental well-being. So being able to connect, even via text messaging, to share the good news with our program facilitators, um, or even if they had bad news and concerns, and they didn't have a partner or have someone that they can share this life-changing um, experience, they needed to have somebody that they can communicate with. So when we're kind of looking at the birth, that was one of the things that was um, sometimes looking at what are the protocols within the, 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 the hospitals in our vicinities and also within our midwifery service practices. Uh, we heard from our participants that at the height of the lockdown, they were very unsettled. Um, they now had to go to specific doctor's appointments uh, and the protocols that were there. They could not have anybody with them. They're by themselves. They're worrying about the potential exposure and being pregnant and also to their new, their new baby of COVID. We now were right into probably our second lockdown and hearing like, here we go again, how long is this going to be? Um, we know it's not something that's going to be dealt with and, and gone and done uh, tomorrow. Um, and still kind of hearing about the variants and how, how that's going to impact um, how we're going to provide service. So we heard from uh, participants, and, and this is an example of one who was planning a home birth, and she felt relieved, and, and some of our participants said that they felt really relieved at first that I'm not having a hospital birth, so I'm now choosing a, a, a home birth because I feel like the cooties are going to be within my own house. I feel more secure. But then as tight uh, as restrictions got a little bit tighter and it got closer to their due date, they were really unsure and were worried about if they had to transition to the hospital or if they chose not to have a, uh, a home birth, you know, who'd be with them? Uh, will they all be masked and gloved uh, throughout the entire process? How was that support going to impact them mentally in uh, progression of labor? They, how would they be able to read facial expressions if something were wrong? They had heightened anxieties. And so being able to have conversations and talk through some of their uh, fears that they were feeling throughout their prenatal as well as postnatal um, appointments was really important. Unfortunately, giving birth during COVID comes with several restrictions in terms of access to healthcare providers, and as well as deliveries are conducted, uh, whether you're in a, a hospital setting or not. And so we worked with our clients to try and keep them up to date on ever changing rules, regulations, protocols that the hospitals maybe have, so that they can understand uh, and, and how their plans for their birth could be impacted or affected. And I think that that also had a huge impact on uh, them being prepared um, for expectations and changes going forward. Postpartum also support is also challenging during these times because many of our families pretty much are feel like they're on their own uh, navigating, um, you know, the, the new parenthood and many first time young moms as well. This is the first time um, going through this experience. So until, you know, recently, um, all of our local breastfeeding clinics and healthy baby programs weren't conducting any in-person visits. And that posed a huge barrier and a, a great challenge for a lot of our, our families who are trying to uh, adjust to um, 
new parenthood. And so we listened to them and gave them an opportunity in a forum for them to say, what are the obstacles, either perceived obstacles or true obstacles during their postpartum uh, period and, and kind of looking at that circle of support of how we can help support them. So having no support for older children, having no now um, children are maybe at home and doing online um, schooling, you know, that, that not only are they home by themselves, but don't have any other support, nobody can kind of come in, they feel like they're in lockdown during the postpartum uh, period, but then they also have, their children are not at school. And so, you know, how, what are some ways that, that can help and look at alleviating and supporting that. Um, and so connecting them sometimes even with online programming uh, during certain times that allow the kids to sort of be um, out of and entertained at certain times or activities um, that our partners would be able to drop off at the house so the kids can do a craft activ activity or uh, playing uh, with uh, some of the engagement activities that allowed her to sort of rest and focus on just the newborn baby. Also family unable to meet their first grandchild. So, you know, struggling with, you know, not being able to have that euphoric moment, not being able to have baby showers, not being able to have celebrations uh, that many family had or wanted to have. So looking at how can we navigate that maybe in an online platform and helping people to be able to sort of do that or social distancing uh, outside platform when some of the um, restrictions were sort of lifted how they can do it sort of safely uh, and for them to feel confident in making sure they're meeting all the protocols but also are being able to have sort of through the window visit <laughs> so to speak uh, drive-by visits um, were, were some of the strategies that they actually um, came up with and shared. And then also struggling with uh, breastfeeding uh, and kind of looking at how can we put them and give them to resources and give them timely uh, information that they could feel like that they were supported during some of those um, milestones. And I think that this quote probably had the biggest sort of impact uh, when I, you know, for our families when they said this was the biggest most challenging adjustment we have literally stripped away the village we are supposed to be surrounded by in the early postpartum days so i think that that's one of the things that you know a lot of us there's the lockdown closed down uh period where um you know that parents would kind of not have visitors, kind of set sort of routines within the, the household, but there aren't any sort of circle of support either. So the feelings of isolation, abandonment, feeling really alone uh, had a huge impact. This past year has left uh, most of our at-risk marginalized populations in peril. What we've seen is the financial impact on COVID was devastating um, as a lot of even our families and our young moms were on the front lines, maybe uh, as a cashier, hairdresser, sales clerk. Um, so their livelihoods and their opportunities to uh, make a living had a huge impact in, in making that decision as do they stay in employment while they're pregnant um, with all this unknown and many of them had a chose not to continue to work because of some of the fear around them, which had a huge impact on their livelihood. Our, our program serves on 26 years of age or under, and what we know is that this de demographic looks um, to technology for many of their needs, and they're incredibly very savvy. Uh, and having those texting capabilities, um, because they can't afford a lot of times minutes, they can't have calling minutes or data. And so we transitioned very quickly to posting all of our information, and we set up our social media platforms we had Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook page specifically for our clients. And we were able to address this by using uh, a new technology that we implemented just before COVID uh, called MessageBox. 
And um, Message Box is a um, online web application that allows anyone to use a phone. So uh, any uh, our, our uh, frontline service providers or community partners could use the platform and the phone comes out and it would say message from Girls Inc. So they, they don't see your personal number. It allows uh, one way communications uh, and then it goes into, there's a, a record of it um, on the database so you can do um, a broad base uh, reporting out uh, so you can let them know that there's a specific program that's coming up on our Facebook page allow links on that and that can go out to all of the the participants as well as something as easy as drive-by mental health to let them know that you're in the driveway and that you can uh, text uh, and give them information while you're outside their door. So due to COVID-19 social distancing protocol, we transitioned all of our contacts with our participants to take place using the text messaging message box app. And all of our social media and Zoom meeting um, platforms allowed to transition our groups and the group times that we would meet in person into a virtual platform. We looked at our groceries uh, vouchers and empowering clients prenatally um, to be able to have some, I think, some choice had, and feel like they had control in their lives, which, which was a huge um, positive impact on their mental health. One of the things that uh, we found um, was allowing them to sort of make a list of support, especially even prenatally that they thought they might need help postnatally, uh, and then also adding to the list postnatally to sort of see, um, because we wanted to make sure that they were identifying what their needs were as opposed to us prescribing the solutions for them. So some of them would put things like they needed help with um, getting food, access to food, um, um, laundry or cleaning help, uh, you know, having access to virtual mommy groups, whether it's having technology, um, you know, problems or having that set up. So we would look to what are some of the needs and then look to our service providers and in-house as well to see how we can help meet those needs with solutions uh, within our networks. Um, driveway mental health checks to help feelings of isolation and then encouraging online engagement for our mom, uh, support groups that we've also set up. So we decided to, uh, when we first um, decided to do some of the um, food, we wanted to make sure that the access to food was what they chose. Um, and how we kind of did that is we sort of did a client shopping list. Um, we had great partnerships with our local grocery stores. Um, we have four different grocery stores that would do shopping for us that would bag it uh, and have it all ready. And then we have volunteer drivers that would pick it up. And we have a sor sorting depot that we do here in our office. And if you hear some background noise, that is exactly what they're doing as I speak right now. So each week our clients are given an opportunity to choose from our client shopping list. And what we wanted to do is kind of bring a sense of normalcy um, during this uh, trying time so that they felt they are choosing their foods. And we heard from them that they did not feel confident going to the grocery store. And many of them also had other children uh, to be navigating the, the, the bus system uh, on and off bus routes. A lot of times it's two or three um, uh, transfers in before they get to the local shopping store that they would have normally would go to. Um, and so they were able to pick any three dairies. So whether it's a bag of milk, eggs, brick cheese, if they had um, dietary concerns, there would be a special form for specific clients that had that and a nutritionist would be involved and that would be um, a separate list. But uh, this was the general shopping list for most of our clients. Um, in their grain area, they would be able to pick two that they wanted uh, to, to pick on our list and three specific vegetables. And we wanted to make sure that instead of giving a good food box or a box that was already pre-packaged, pre-made, what we know is we didn't want to give them a bunch of contents that they don't eat or um, they would not be interested. 
in introducing. We'd also pack with um, the list as well as suggestions of recipes. And then we also did online uh, cooking segments as well, which used a lot of the items within. And what we found was that a lot of clients would then maybe try new items that were in the previous recipe before to recreate that recipe the following, following week. So um, I'm just going to ask right now, are there any questions, Sydney, uh, on about uh, any of the issues that we had? Um, is that, no, I'm not seeing a question directed at you. There was a question about uh, reporting ages on forms, but uh, Blanca did answer it. In Perfect. The, awesome. In so our individualized outreach grocery delivery to the clients uh, was in full swing um, at Food for Thought for over a year or so. So we started to do it and we thought it would just be an interim time, right? We'll just do it while there's the initial lockdown, things are going to go back to normal, look similar to SARS. Uh, we did not know that we would be doing it um, for over a, a year now. And I think it is a massive undertaking as our numbers continue to climb. Uh, we've been very uh, extremely fortunate that we received incredible support from local grocery stores. So our no frills, our food basics uh, and Real Canadian Superstore have been instrumental in our programming and rolling it out in a cohesive way and doing those uh, shopping for us. We also have a huge network of volunteers and a lot of local volunteers who um, have come to drive so that they would do a contact list pickup of our groceries. Uh, we'd have a time for them to come in and arrive, have their route already printed out for them, which mom and which driveways that they're going to do to the drop in the text number that would be text when they arrived. Um, and, and we do that on a weekly basis. Um, and they've also, um, I think, are really excited uh, completely um, from not only from getting the the um, the food, but also getting a mental health check in to be able to sort of see how our moms are doing. Um, and what we uh, find that the streamlined kind of ordering process and the entire putting of the order together uh, allowed also the curbside pickup. Um, that staff don't have to enter into our grocery stores as well to pick up the food. So we have staff that was doing uh, the shopping. We have program support workers that actually do the bulk shopping and shop in bulk and then would take it to uh, Food for Thought as well as some that would do delivery that was pre-COVID. So this really allowed us when we created that shopping list of nutritional foods for our clients, uh, allowed them not only to shop for their um, groceries, uh, but to also being able to choose the foods, it kept all helped cut down on our food waste because um, uh, clients were only receiving the food in their family that they wanted to eat or were willing or interested in eating. And that sometimes wasn't the case uh, when we provided or saw hamper type programs. Um, it also makes a, a, a greater organi organization and orchestration on the, on the part of the staff because all the food, like I said, has to be kind of brought to the org, um, office, it has to be organized, divided accordingly by individual owner uh, and the orders and then the maps on where people live and kind of geographically kind of making our volunteers kind of go to one area as opposed because Durham's quite large uh, to be able to that to be able to make it the additional time and effort worthwhile. So Food for Thought continues uh, to enroll clients. And I think what's important as other community resources continue to be closed or alter their delivery program we are regularly receiving referrals from community partners that are working hard to ensure that our clients are supported and that they also feel connected uh, for the, not only for themselves, but their babies during the lo lockdown as well. So this, I, I think in one of the things that have come out, and I think it's the length of time, we know that our frontline service providers are exceptional. Um, and 
one of the things that we know about trauma-informed care, that providing training to our leadership teams and having our leaders explore concepts of burnout, uh, vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, these are all ways that can disrupt service delivery. And we wanna make sure that we are not only taking care of our clients' mental health, but we're looking at our staff's mental health as well. And what are strategies that we can put into place to address them? And I think that there'll be some more uh, strategies later as well. But what we know is that um, sometimes people who are drawn to our mission driven work so that the work that we do um, has values um, and are sometimes heavily connected to the reason why we're drawn to it. So one of the things that uh, we did is some training in and around looking at um, some of the I guess, unsubtle concepts that we have around work and delivering to at-risk population. This is a sort of a tongue-in-cheek kind of response that we kind of during COVID. So this is a working hard and always available.com email address right around our availability. We felt like, you know, thank you for your email. We're always at our desk, right? I'm going to have my kidney stones removed between one to two, but uh, we'll be available at 245. That's probably the recovery room and giving out our cell number. We'll be back at our desk by four, right? And sort of that um, you're committed because the demonstration that you're committed is that you're always available, always on. And so how do we challenge some of that perception and how do we challenge kind of a work-life balance uh, in addressing maybe some of the, the burnout that happens with many frontline service providers? So this is sort of the balanced life approach uh, uh, that many of our colleagues in Western Europe may have around availability. So kind of looking at you know, I'll be away from my desk from May to June, <laughs> over a month and a half hiking up in the Norwegian forts. It's okay for us to be able to say, this is the time I'm taking away. This is my availability and I'll be back uh, able to address your concerns uh, after that time in July. You know, I think that those are the conversations that we have to kind of look at as to um, where our values lie. So when we're looking at self-care and um, kind of experience or chat, we have to take time to journal, think, or even talk through with close friends, connections. We do that internally as well in our group work, in our Zoom work. Um, and we want to make sure that the, the way that we can work to fulfill and have kind of the rewarding work that many non-for-profit services provide uh, is making sure that if we ex experience like circumstances or trauma on a regular basis, the impact that it's having. So hearing all the stories and the impacts that COVID is having on the families that we actually serve, many of us also have all kinds of hurdles and, and um, barriers within our old lives that, that we are dealing with. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have open and clear communications with not only your supervisors, but your coworkers so that we feel supported of one another. So that, you know, that whole saying of you can't give from a, a, an empty well. So what does this do? I think that understanding and having uh, the, these discussions can foster great pa a passion, understanding and care. But also if we deny and don't have sort of a self-care plan for our frontline service provider, it can lead quickly to burnout, um, having our own trauma triggered and other feelings that can get in the way of doing the best work and caring for our, ourselves in the most robust ways. So no matter the work that we do, uh, I truly believe everybody needs a self-care strategy. And um, so this is one of the things that we do that, you know, you have maybe haven't experienced trauma, but you may feel that the effects of the hardships that our clients face every day. Uh, many social service providers find that this is true. So having and being exposed to the hardships and hearing their stories, um, they hear it over and over. It's so common so uh, that we actually have a name for it and we call it vicarious trauma.
So it does require attention uh, to keep us healthy, happy, and fully engaged. And so one of the things that uh, we sort of do is kind of have that conversation. Uh, does it ever make it challenging for you to do your work? So having a, a colleague, a buddy system that you can kind of support one another, having a circle of support or a co-word within your workplace, um, being able to sort of discuss if you haven't experienced trauma but can feel the effects on uh, vicarious trauma through our works. And what are some of the ways that we can kind of do that? So based on the, the core work that we've sort of done is identifying of values and self-care strategies that come up from there. And I think where it comes from is hearing from other mental health service providers. So for example, um, if my trauma and, and I, I suffered um, abuse and trauma, feelings of alone and isolation can be a huge trigger for me. So having somebody to say, oh, make sure you go in, um, you know, we're going to go through a mindful uh, yoga session right now, and I want you to close your eyes. Um, that can cause great trauma for me. Um, that can then make me feel singled out because I don't want to close my eyes, that I don't feel relaxed. This is not something that is helping me uh, is to be able to identify how uh, I can relax and, and tap into mindfulness that I need for me. So I think this exercise allows you to identify your plan. What are your core values? And then how can your circle of support, being your coworkers, your um, uh, supervisor, be, or even your family, be a support system for you? And then when you identify your um, five core values, for each of the value, name a way that you can honor it, right? And so um, I think that one of the ways, again, not only honor it um, personally, but honor it uh, in your work. Um, so something as simple as kind of it could be something like, I'm a morning person. Uh, I love to get up really uh, early in the morning to start my day. I feel like that's where I feel control and centered. Uh, it's a way for me also to connect with my staff or board or uh, in, in, in work. So I prefer to have check-in meetings in the morning. I'm, the, I'm at my best uh, and can, can give the attention that's needed between 7 and 9.30. If my colleagues or my board knows that about me, um, they're not going to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me at 9 p.m. Right. And so if that's some a, a small way of understanding how I work uh, and how they can help support me. Also looking at maybe limiting and, and I have a hard time maybe setting back boundaries. As most women, we tend to put our hands up for everything. We're doers. We're the juggling the five million balls in the air. Um, and I often joke that I when I retire, I'm going to have a support group where we all sit in a in a circle and all we do is chant no. No, right? <laughs> Learning how to set no and setting boundaries. Um, but, you know, limiting the number of meetings that you're on, being able that no is a full sentence, not having to have any explanation, um, having help in that. Uh, your coworkers or your supervisor can kind of help in uh, finding those. So I think what this activity does is not only identifying what your core values are, but how each of the value, how you can name a way of honoring it and then sharing that um, with your circle of support within the office and within your employer helps you uh, have a self-care plan that's right for you, right? So for example, if I were uh, it's a pandemic and I'm going to say everybody's working really hard. Take Friday off Friday, you know, you just for some people that for them being engaged, having a task, being able to come uh, and sometimes being able to come to work, leave their office is a place for them to feel safe and self care. And so by me prescribing what's going to happen without having a conversation and a dialogue on what they need may not be the most beneficial support uh, or viewed as, as a form of support. Um, and then 
one of the questions that we answer for ourselves again, and this is internal reflection, is what gets in the way of self-care for you right now? Um, and so I find that by naming it and putting it down and ha looking and focusing at least two self-care practices that you can commit to in a year, and then allowing how your circle of support, whether it's your co-staff or uh, your boss, on how you can um, help uh, help achieve that as well. So for me, uh, the example that I used as well is having a supportive workplace, helping honor professional boundaries. Um, so I found that in a pandemic, the number of after hour meetings, volunteer meetings, uh, things, special groups that we're doing after hours, um, you know, I don't know if I'm working during the day or in the evening. It seems like I've had more 12 hour, uh, 15 hour days than I ever had pre um, pandemic. And so, you know, for me, that self care practice is looking at setting boundaries. And so, reevaluating uh, schedules and focus of priorities of the different committees that you're on, different ways of communicating. Do you have to have a meeting about a meeting? Maybe we can reduce the numbers. Maybe are there different ways of checking in? And so that's just one sort of example of kind of looking at how do we utilize these tools to help our frontline service providers have their best mental health in mind so that then they can continue to support uh, the women that we have within our, um, in our communities as well. Um, I think the the closing and before I kind of take uh, sort of some some questions as well uh, in is just understanding that the work that we actually do um, for the last 25 years, like I said before, that our methodology to deliver um, and meet our women where they're at um, has changed, whether we're doing it in person or whether we're doing it via Zoom or text messaging or drive, driveway drop-ins. But our multidisciplinary team and the work that we actually do has not changed. Um, and it allows us to affect the level of confidence and knowledge um, on the prenatal healthy lifestyles, breastfeeding and offering the risk reduction as a primary service uh, and response that's reflective of our local community needs and is ever changing and pivoting as those needs changed for the past 45 years. So I think our participants have improved uh, in taking on and embracing uh, social support networks, uh, reducing feelings of isolation, and our, the numbers have grown exponentially of the numbers of participants that are um, logging on to our Zoom programming, uh, the feedback that we get from them from our driveway meetups and um, having that extra staff text check-in uh, has really made a huge impact on their mental health um, during this pandemic. So thank you so much. You bet, thank you so much. I, I have a really, uh, so appreciative of hearing the breadth and the depth of the, of the work that you're doing. And there were actually so many things that I feel like we could dive deep into, um, you know, your use of, of technology, how you've been addressing the barriers. And I really, really appreciate, um, you know, the insights you've given us into, uh, you know, self-care for ourselves as, as workers. So, um, so thank you so much for, for your time. And, um, there is a question about uh, tracking drivers that I wonder if we could circle back to uh, at, at the end, or perhaps you might offer, um, uh, you know, commentary in, in the chat. Um, so, so tracking mental health check-ins. So we will we'll circle around back to that. And um, I'll invite Blanca to, to come on and see if she's found a question for our giveaway. And while we're waiting for her, that I also want to acknowledge um, your your volunteer work as the chair of uh, the central zone. Uh, that's something that uh, perhaps people in the central zone know they've met you, but uh, something um, that you know. My time is up. We're looking for a new co-chair. Come on in. Well, <laughs> so there's on. a good plug. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I, Blanca, are you there? 
or did we did we maybe lose her? Maybe we'll do both of them at the end. So you've had thank you so much. And what we'll do is we'll ask Ellen to come on. Hello, Ellen. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to to welcome you and introduce you and say that um, you are Ellen Bachtold. And I know that you uh, work for Building Blocks for Better Babies and CPNP programs there. And you also offer your time chairing the uh, zone with the Southwest zone. So um, just real dedication demonstrated by both you and Yvette for, for this work. And um, so I'm going to hand it over to you and we look forward to hearing what, what you have to say and, and we'll, we'll, I'll be right here if you need me. All right, thanks, Sydney. I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint and can everybody see my PowerPoint now? I think so. Okay. Yes, you can see it. So, like Sydney said, I'm from the Southwest Zone. I'm from Windsor, and we I co-chair, I, I co-coordinate, and I'm a frontline staff person for Building Blocks for Better Babies. Um, it's the CPMP program in Windsor and Essex County. We run three programs down here normally, in normal times, that's what we do. And, and you'll see through this that things have changed a little bit. Uh, and also I do co-chair the Southwest Zone. So anybody who's in the Southwest who doesn't come to our meetings, you need to get a hold of me and I'll hook you up. We have a meeting on Monday. All right. Why me? I get this message from Blanca and Sydney uh, a couple of weeks ago. Hey, Ellen, do you want to do this? And my first instinct is, oh, why? Why would they choose me? Why are they asking me? Um, you know, I'm not an expert on maternal mental health. I'm not a trained counselor. I'm not even a researcher. I'm just a little old dietitian working with CPNP forever. So why do they want me to do this? And I guess it, when, you, when I think about it a little bit more, it's because, and anybody who's worked with me, my co-host co to uh, Building Blocks here in uh, Windsor, Karen Harrop, she knows that I just have a passion for maternal mental health. And I, um, I talk about it all the time. Southwest Zone will know that as well. Um, so where did my passion come from? How did this happen? I've been working in CPNP since it really started. I helped write the initial grant proposal for the Windsor-Essex County area. I was working at the health unit and then I decided to come and work uh, with the CPNP um, on a more permanent basis after I had a couple of kids and didn't wanna work full time anymore. So I did this and I did this and I talked to moms, but I didn't really touch on mental health so much. Uh, I didn't really feel qualified. I, I didn't think I had the skills. I didn't think that it was my job to do it. And then in 2013, I was asked to attend um, the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit training in Halifax and to represent Southwest Zone. And I thought a trip to Halifax, yes, I'm in. I'm all about a trip to Halifax, never been there. And then they were like, oh, but with that also comes that I needed to bring the toolkit back to the Southwest Zone and provide facilitator training. And so I did that. And some of you may have attended that back in 2013, 2014, uh, the training on mother's mental health. Um, but what this toolkit did for me and anybody who hasn't looked at it before, you should get a, get a copy of it. It really just gave me a confidence to talk to moms and to open the conversation and to ask them questions about them, their mental health, where I just wasn't doing it uh, before. So here we were, we were now, this is it. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna ask moms about stuff and we're gonna see um, how they feel about it. Um, and from that, uh, then I joined the maternal mental health community of practice years later, and I see that some of my uh, my co group people from um, the community of practice Janet Severns I see you're on the call here today. Uh, we just had was like minded people we just had some really great conversations about mother's mental health and what were we doing in our communities and what else could we offer for to our moms. 
And it made me think, hmm, are we doing enough? In Windsor and Essex, is there more that we can do to help moms? Uh, yes, we're asking moms about it. Yes, we've included some training and some classes on new mother's emotions and on mental health, but is that enough? And so this is where we sat down with our group here in Windsor, Essex, and we talked as a committee with our frontline staff, what else can we do? And we decided that we would implement what we now call our mental health minutes. And these are small little um, teaching opportunities all throughout our program that we have implemented these so that it's not just a one big class on new mother's emotion, but now we're gonna just touch on these things over and over and over again and to keep the message alive. So a little bit back to the mother's mental health toolkit some of the facts that really impacted me and made me want to do more about mental health is that this quote, a woman is at the highest risk in her lifetime of developing a new mental illness in the first year after a baby's born, their highest time. And I thought, hmm, okay, so we're already working with moms. What can we do? Then the next one was at least 15% of new mothers experience significant postpartum mood disorders uh, in, that, in that postpartum time. 15%, that's a lot of women. And that doesn't even count the moms that are having just your regular baby blues, which is also can be painful. But this is the one that I thought that really, uh, the, they suggest that 50% of women with a postpartum mood disorder never seek treatment. That was a stat that I got from the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit. But I was on, uh, uh, Blanca had mentioned in the chat about the um, Life with Baby webinar last week, and they're suggesting that it's closer to 85% of women never seek treatment. So they're not getting any help. So why don't they seek treatment? I think we all know a lot of these answers and maybe the biggest one is that stigma around mental health. Yes, it's getting way better than it ever was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mental health, we didn't talk about it at all. Uh, but certainly there is definitely still a stigma around why people don't get treatment. There's limited understanding. There's lack of options. In Windsor and Essex County, we don't have lots of options for uh, mental health treatment, let alone maternal mental health. Um, and it, all these other reasons. And I think one that we hear often is the second last one is the fear that their child will be taken from them if they admit to having any of these problems. And then finally, don't know where to go for help. So, you know, one of my aha moments. So there are women in our community who are suffering on their own probably 85% of women, maybe more than that, that are suffering on their own. So what can we do to help our CPNP moms? So this, when I reflect upon what did we implement, we really started to talk about it. We were asking about it. We were teaching about it. And then we would repeat this over and over and over again. So talk, ask, teach, talk, ask, teach. And the first thing that we wanted to do is normalize the conversation where I didn't feel confident, not, I didn't feel good about talking about maternal mental health 10 years ago, that's how women felt. And I didn't want them to feel that way. So I wanted us to be able to normalize this conversation and to talk about it all the time. If I start asking you about your mental health, maybe you'll be talking to other women about it. Talk to your friends, talk to your sisters, talk to your mom, talk to your husband, uh, talk to your partner about how you're feeling. So one of the very first things that we did after I took the maternal mental health toolkit training was we implemented a question on intake. Have you ever had depression, low mood, or the baby blues in the past? And we were shocked by what people were responding. People wanted to talk about this. So Imagine this on a person's very first time coming to meeting me for the first time at our program. This is a very personal question that I'm asking them. And they were disclosing to us that, yes, I have. I've had mental health problems. I've had um, what probably would be described as postpartum depression in the past. Yes, I have had it. 
some moms, it was interesting because they would reflect upon it and say, you know, I think I did have postpartum depression, but I didn't realize I was having it while I was having it. Uh, in asking this question, and this will always stick with me, I had two moms who reported what was very obviously, um, ex they experienced a psychosis. Uh, one had a plan for, um, or ideas of killing her baby, and one had ideas of killing herself. And so I'm sitting in this, you know, I'm, I'm in a church gym asking these questions and they're disclosing this information. So, and this was past pregnancies that they, they had been clients in our CPNP program during that pregnancy, but I didn't know that they had experienced that in the past because A, they didn't come back after they had their baby. And isn't that a reality that women that are experiencing any type of depression or mental health issues are not likely to leave the house and go out and get some help? Um, and also I asked, did you receive any type of formal counseling for this? And they hadn't, and um, they, but they had, they knew they needed help. So some had uh, reached out to a pastor at their church and the other one had really, really worked and prayed about it and, and luckily came through those. But we were very surprised by, we asked the question and they told us the truth. Then when they return after the baby, instead of saying, you know, how's the baby? How much did it weigh? You know, how much does it weigh now? We wanted to know, how are you doing? How is your mood? So those are things that we immediately were able to implement. Then the next step was to include regular classes. So we have a postnatal new mother's emotions class. And uh, based upon information from the maternal mental health toolkit, we implemented a life as a mom class, and we do that prenatally, helping moms to prepare uh, for, their, for their new role as a mom. Great, so we were great, we've done, and this is some of the uh, classes that I do, this life as a mom class, it's very much a brainstorming. I have a flip chart paper and we scribble all over it. They yell out their answers. And it's really just a way for me to use pretty markers because I really, really love using markers. So I love doing this class and it gets moms talking with each other about what some, how, what they expect. Some of the moms have already had children so they can share some of their information as well. It's just a really great time to talk about what's going to happen, what's coming up. So these are some pictures of some of my flip charts that we've done. Um, if you could go back in time, what would you, what advice would you tell yourself? What advice would you give to a friend or a sister that's going to have a baby? And these are some of the responses, you know, trust your instincts, lower your expect, expectations, don't compare to other moms and be kind to yourself. One of the uh, messages that always comes out is there is no amount of preparation. Nobody can ever help prepare you for how much work becoming a mom really is. And that's a good chat to have with moms. Again, from the toolkit, we start looking at self-care and where they can get some help and not to, uh, don't forget to ask for help. So who are the people in your life that can help you? And what are you, what are your plans for self-care? What are you currently doing or what could you do for self-care? Great, so we have this great conversation and then it rolls into, and it's very lighthearted, and then it rolls into a little bit more um, what if. The what if, it's more than the baby blues. What are some of those signs and symptoms that you might be experiencing the postpartum depression? So we talk about those and, and just make sure that they know what to look for, also that their partners know what to look for. Um, and then I do this section, the 10%, Blanca mentioned it, 10% of dads have some type of postpartum depression. And I like to acknowledge that as well with moms because I think we sometimes forget about the dads. And so I acknowledge that as well with them. So yeah, great. We have these great classes. We have a prenatal class and we have a postnatal class. But are we doing enough? What if they miss one of those classes? What if a mom just didn't come that day? So does that mean they have to wait for three months to get that class again? And hopefully they'll get it at that point? 
maybe it's not enough. Are we doing enough? And I keep coming back to this. I remind myself all the time that 50 to 85% of women never seek treatment. So, but what I also know is that they're already coming to us prenatally. We have this great captive audience of prenatal moms that are dying to learn some information. So what are we doing? Are we doing enough? And that's where we decided that doing these uh, very comprehensive postpartum depression classes or new mother's emotions classes, doing those just three or four times a year maybe isn't enough. We need to have, we wanted to have small snippets of information. So we came up with the mental health minute idea. And it's a collection of interactive, entertaining ideas that we can include in all different types of CPMP classes at the beginning of the class, at the end of the class, in the middle of the class to just keep making mental health a common topic. So we came up with some as dietitians. Our public health nurses were great at sending some to us and we worked as a group. And we often get nursing and dietetic students here. So that was another great opportunity to give them uh, an activity to come up with at least one or two mental health minutes that we could include in our library of mental health minutes. So I looked around at my desk and I had like little pieces of paper all over the place that, oh, here's an idea and here's an idea. And I had file folders. And so I finally got up the energy to create basically an index on of all the different activities that I'd come up with, that our nurses had come up with and our students had come up with. And I tried to categorize them in different um, categories in an index. So we have general activities and there's, I don't know, seven or eight of those. And we have self-care activities, um, the a bingo class, a self-care jar, a self-care grab bag, uh, lots of different activities. So these are the index. And then there's a description of each one of these. And some of them then have activities that go with them. We have lots on self-affirmation and self-esteem activities, um, both different ones with breastfeeding, all different kinds. Uh, gratitude, we do lots of things on gratitude and just talking about it and just getting that ball rolling for gratitude. So I'm going to share, um, these are another list of mindfulness, relaxation and breathing activities, and then different relaxation apps that we can suggest as well. So in total, there's about 40 different activities that are in, that are in our list of the index of mental health minutes. And to be honest, we haven't used them all. We use some of them. Um, I'm not as comfortable doing uh, meditation-y types of things, but our nurse, that one of our nurses that works with us does a great job with the uh, meditation stuff. So I've included all of these in our little binder, um, our mental health minute binder. So we can pick and choose from stuff depending on who's there, uh, who's teaching the class. So one of the ones that we're very most proud of, and this was one of our nursing students came up with this idea. And this is our self-affirmation, uh, I am a mom um, pad, notepad. And we printed these in full color and it's a 25 page notepad, almost like a shopping list style. And every page has a different affirmation on it. So these are just some of the examples. I'm a mom, I'm a strong and loving mom. Uh, being a good mom means I take care of myself and my needs. And my family appreciates and loves me even when they forget to tell me. So we send these out to moms, uh, we give them out to moms, but we also use this as a teaching opportunity uh, in a class where we talk about some of these and ask moms, where are they, what are they feeling right now as a mom? Because these feelings change day by day, minute by minute. Uh, how we feel as a mom changes very much throughout our, uh, our mom experience. I have, I'm a mom of older children, but a lot, or, a lot of these still pertain to me. You know, we think often that these are new mom types of things or young mom, uh, moms with young babies. But even as we grow older in our mom experience, some of these things still very much pertain to us. 
we do bingo. We played the self-care bingo. This was an idea I got from Janet Siverns with her uh, Nest, the uh, nutrition, exercise, sleep, time for self, and support. Uh, and each one of the categories has different ideas for self-care under each one of those categories. So under nutrition, it's always all very nutrition related. So we printed these and we played games and then we had, you know, great prizes to give out uh, well, dollar store prizes, but they seemed great at the time. Uh, they were very related to self-care kinds of prizes that went along with it. Moms loved this. So we did this like as a game, as a fun day, but I think that the message also went home with them as well. What are some of those uh, things that we need to start thinking about for ourselves? self-care. We talked about a gratitude jar and the importance of gratitude and recognizing some of those small things that bring joy uh, and that practicing gratitude is a very healthy thing to do and it it helps moms to uh, to be more um, it's part of their self-care if they can practice gratitude if anybody's ever done that before. But I think gratitude is really a very broad concept and maybe a little bit tricky for some of the moms. You know, we, we can say, oh, here's a journal, go home and write down everything you're grateful for. But that seemed like it was a little too tricky. So then we came up with, uh, now this is just some examples, but this was what we call our gratitude conversation starter page. So we give these to moms a whole page, they can cut them out, put them at the dinner table and talk about them with their family. They could do it on their own. If they don't have older kids, they can talk with their husbands, but maybe it's just helping them to identify some of those little things in their life that are bringing them, uh, bringing them joy. What is one thing that made you happy today? What is your favorite smell? So it's identifying some of those small things um, that really do bring joy to their day. We include mental health minutes all over the place. So even in a label reading class as a way to bring some, bring it back to moms and what a great job they're doing. We have, uh, you know, what is the nutritional facts for a mom? You know, unconditional love, unrivaled skill, hardworking, caring, wrong answer, 0%. And caffeine is 110%. So it's just our way to remind moms during um, a class not related to mental health at all that they are doing a great job. And this is a tough job that we're doing as moms. Sydney, I see there's chat stuff. Do you need me to stop for a minute? Hey, Ellen. I hope it's not too distracting. It's actually just, um, I'm not seeing specific questions okay. for you. There's a lot of appreciation for what you're sharing. There is a question um, about sharing your, your slides um, uh, later as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll check in with you about that. Okay, great. Uh, then yeah. I'll just keep rolling in here because I know we're short on time. This is one that I, uh, we came up with. It's um, really just, uh, I like to call it the what to say, what not to say who a mo to a mom who's uh, experiencing any type of low mood. This was a great conversation starter with the moms. Um, just whether they are experiencing a low mood or if they've known someone or how to talk to a friend who might be having low mood. So I, I just have little, um, little pieces of paper that I pull out of a hat. How do you feel about this one? Just snap out of it. And then we paste it to the board on which side they think it would, should go to. So they didn't like just snap out of it at all. That should be on a what not to say. But what can I do to help? So it's not, obviously some of these are quite obvious, but it's ways that moms could also help a friend or speak to a friend or reach out to somebody who might be experiencing a low mood. Things aren't that bad. Um, you've got the perfect life you know you have a great baby so cute everything's going well why are you not feeling well so all of these and we had a whole bunch of them and we just talked about it and uh and really it just brought out their feelings about being a mom 
being a mom is a tough job, admitting that, that and helping them to see that, that this isn't all that it really maybe was cracked up to be. So we had all these really great 40 ideas. They worked super great in a group setting. And then COVID. And we have all of this isolation. What do we do now? How are we going to help moms? What can we do to help moms? And we went from having these amazing in-person programs and there was all kinds of um, interaction with moms and one-on-one -on -one here and there and moms speaking with moms. And now suddenly, forget in-person, we had to reinvent the way we do business uh, for our CPNP program, just like all of us across the uh, province have had to do. And we started with virtual programming, parking lot pickups, we're emailing, texting. Suddenly we're texting our moms and they're texting us back and they have our contact information. Prior to COVID, we were very much an in-person program. So if we saw you on Tuesday, great, we chatted with you. We'll see you next Tuesday is basically what would happen. There wasn't much interaction between Tuesdays. They didn't email us. They didn't text us. Suddenly, they have this venue to reach out to us. And it seemed like, you know what? Maybe this was an even better way to reach moms. So we have very different interactions now. One-on-one um, -on -one communication. We could get a message from a mom saying, you know, and we did get messages. I'm just not feeling great. You know, uh, this is, uh, I'm, my mood is low. I'm not, you know, functioning at the same level. And we were getting these messages. What do we do with all of that? Uh, we, so, but we could also check in with moms. So if a mom, you know, even if we were in a virtual class and they just seemed a little down, we could send a little message that said, hey, just checking in, see how you're doing. And we all know moms were suffering in our community, we, every community, moms were suffering during COVID. So what are we gonna do? And I kept, we kept coming back to this question, are we doing enough for their mental health? Are we doing enough? And then we wondered if maybe we're even doing a better job. Uh, we went back to our list of mental health minutes and we wondered where can we add these to our classes? Uh, we, so we started off, we're having more personal interactions because they're texting us, they're calling us, we're getting emails from moms all the time. We can make really quick referrals to our public health nurse and the social worker and the HBHC program. So if a mom discloses to us that she's having low mood, we had, now we suddenly had this kind of quick, like, oh, I'm just going to be able to send this referral off. And we almost have a hotline to the health unit and to the public health nurses there for their support. And that felt good. Uh, we were able to make referrals to Bounce Back Ontario and moms then would join the group and they'd say, well, you gotta try this Bounce Back Ontario program. That really helped me. And it was amazing to see moms that were so suffering from mental health, but also wanted to share with other moms their experience and how to fix the problem and or how to help with it. Uh, we had our virtual COVID updates from the public health nurse. And then we were doing some of these mental health minute virtual activities. We included um, ver prenatal fitness. We have that twice a week. That's helpful. I am a mom after. Yeah. Uh, we had some of the affirmations, the self-care bingo we were able to do. Uh, and then we were doing monthly mailings. So we would include something in the mailing all the time about uh, maternal mental health. So I was going to launch a poll, but we're running out of questions. But these are some of those mom affirmations. So I'm not perfect. I'm exactly what my family needs. These are what we've uh, included in our classes to talk to moms about the different feelings that you have as a mom in your different phases of being a mom. So I'm not gonna launch the poll, we're running out of time. But when I think about this whole class, you know, in me doing this webinar today, maybe these mental health minutes, maybe you're not gonna include some, I would guess that lots of you are already using lots of these uh, mental health types of activities. I've just kind of put them into a little index. 
But really what I hope is that we will normalize the conversation. Go out there, ask your moms about it, talk to your moms about it, reduce the stigma about maternal mental health. Moms want to talk about it, but they don't always know how to start the conversation. So, and just to finally remember that a healthy mom always helps to have a healthy family and it all comes back to that. So that's it for today. Now, oh, Sydney, we have a couple of minutes left. So I hope you have some time. Thank you, Ellen, thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Um, I just love hearing your, your overview of, um, you know, how you kind of, you know, this, your, your, your focus was inspired and shaped and, and some of the fabulous resources and, 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 and approaches that you, um, that you've, uh, you know, with your team have, have come up with. And I, I'm seeing, you know, lots of thank yous um, and, and gratitude in, in the chat, which is, uh, which is really awesome. Um, I think the only question I did see was around the slides for both you and, and Yvette, if you're willing to share those. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we are recording the session, so, so that will be available as well. Um, so I think now um, I, have, I have set permission, so this time Blanca is able to join us. Uh, I felt bad last time I was calling for her, and, and I had blocked her, and she said, come on. <laughs> I couldn't go on. That's so, okay. so if you do have a question for, for Ellen or Yvette, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. And maybe while you're doing that, we will have our contest. We have two copies of the book that Ellen suggested, Self Care for Mom, available. And Blanca agreed to come up with a couple of questions. And how it will work, Blanca, you'll ask the question. And um, we could go by my um, uh, chat screen and the first person to answer it correctly will win the book. How does that sound? Sounds good. Will that work? So do you have a question for us? So I'll, I'll do a question for uh, Yvette's presentation. And okay. I, I, I kept them simple, easy, okay. I hope. <laughs> um, so what is the name of Yvette's CPMP project? The name of the project. What is the name of Yvette's project? So I see Lori Wilson has answered Girls Inc. So I think that that's, so that's the organization. Oh, oh Sarah okay. got it. Food for thought, Sarah, you oh. win. Well, Lori, I apologize for getting your hopes up. You and I were on the same page. So is it Sarah Degagne who has won? Yes. Sarah came on first with food for thought. Okay, excellent. Congratulations, Sarah. And um, I know we've been connected by email, but if you want to send me an email, Sarah, we can, we can follow up. And the second question. And the second question for Ellen's presentation, what is the name of the resource that Ellen Ellen went on training for and used for coming back and training the Southwest Zone. What is the name okay. of the resource? Okay. Well, uh, Leanne Kennedy, I think, got it first. Um, there's two Leannes, and in my my um, Leanne Caskinet. But but she there's a slight. So she has maternal mother kit, and it's actually mother's mental health toolkit oh okay so, and so Lori has Lori Wilson has mental health toolkit and Leanne Kaskina has maternal mother kit but it's Leanne Kennedy who has it correct first mother's mental health toolkit right yes yes well congratulations Leanne Kennedy and um Leanne uh, I will do my best to follow up with you, but please also send me an email so that we can be in contact and we can get that, that um, resource to you. So congratulations to Sarah Degagne and Leanne Kennedy for each winning a copy of uh, the Mental Health Toolkit. And thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Yvette and Ellen for their time today. I know how busy uh, they both are, and um, it was just really great to hear from both of you. And um, 
really inspiring and, and invigorating both hearing the initiatives that you both have taken in, in your communities and in your projects and, and ideas for, um, for the rest of us to kind of inspire our work. So um, I didn't spot any other questions in the chat. Uh, it was going by pretty quickly. So my apologies if I did miss one, but we are kind of almost at, at time here. Um, so I guess if either <laughs> Ellen or Yvette have any last words they want to say, otherwise we will we will bid everybody a fond farewell. Uh, the only thing I would say is go check out the Mother's Mental Health Toolkit. It yes. is online. You can find that. You just type it in and there are different links to it to find that. There are some nice uh, ideas to just help you get started with some of those. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Blanca, any final thoughts from you? Um, yes, and I also wanted to mention, we actually have hard copies, some hard copies of the toolkits. Oh. Unfortunately, they're at the office. Uh, we're not able to mail those out right now. But uh, as soon as we're able to, if you're interested, please let me know. I will mail one out to you. Um, but, you know, whenever we are, you know, back in the office and... Uh, Gotcha. Who knows when that will be, but when that is, <laughs> please let me know if you're interested. I will uh, mail you a copy. And, yes, I just wanted to thank uh, Yvette and Ellen and Sydney because without <laughs> you guys, it wouldn't have happened. So I'm really, I'm really glad that we were able to have this time together. And I did want to mention uh, last week on May 5th, uh, there were a few events happening. Uh, one of them was hosted by the Canarian, Canadian Perinatal Mental Health Collaborative. And um, one of the speakers uh, who is uh, from the international community um, had mentioned that um, the most effective agent of change in maternal mental health is uh, the actions of individuals and the collaboration between individuals and organizations. And so you guys are it, you guys are agents of change and we appreciate the work that you do uh, through CAPC and CPMP and in your own communities and in your own families. And I really appreciated um, Yvette's and Alan's input into uh, self-care. Mm -hmm. That is such an important yes. piece. Yes. And uh, do not forget to self-care. So thank you so much. I, I see a couple of people have expressed interest in the toolkits, Blanca. I assume the best thing is for them to email you and maybe if they don't have your email handy, they could email me and I could forward yes. to you. Is that the, the probably the best thing? That would be great, yes. Okay. And, and like I said, uh, I wish if we were in the office, we would mail you out you know, one right away, but it'll be some time, I think, in Toronto for us to be back in the office, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, but yeah. it is online. So like Ellen mentioned, so I guess the next best thing would be for you to check it out online. Okay. Okay. So email Blanca directly. If you don't happen to have her email, you can shoot one over to me and I will forward it to her. And um, so I think that is our time together. I did put an evaluation uh, link. We, you know, we always have these short little evaluation forms for our events and we appreciate hearing your feedback. Uh, not only on the content and you know how we host our our events but ideas you have for future gatherings always really great to hear and i also put a plug in for um, an, an upcoming graphic facilitation workshop that we're hosting over two days and people were really admiring your flip chart ellen and i i shamelessly use that as a plug to encourage people who want to improve their flip charting skills that they could take our, our graphic uh, facilitation workshops and, and be able to just sort of really have those visually appealing um, uh, skills. So I, I shamelessly uh, used you as an advertisement for our workshop. <laughs> and, I love markers. <laughs> that's awesome. So thanks everybody for, for joining us. Um, it was really great to spend time together. Uh, really great to, to hear from Two of our um, really wise and committed network members who do such important work with uh, in maternal mental health in our event um, 
raising uh, awareness about the issue. And um, thank you, Blanca, for you know always working hard to host uh, hold space around this this issue, and um, yeah, being being a support in in bringing us together. So have a lovely rest of the day, and uh, watch the upcoming newsletters for links to the recording and and um, and and the slides and things like that. So take care, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Sydney. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye.